I quit the law the day I graduated from law school to create an online course for high school students and it was a disaster. And I finally figured out why. I discovered a game-changing new approach to creating content. It's helped me build an audience of 6,000 plus across platforms and rack up over 2 million views on my content. You see, there are two types of creators. There is the content solicitor, and then there is the content scientist. I'm gonna show you why most people are content solicitors, why those people are doomed to fail, and why you need to become a content scientist. So by the end of this lesson, you will have a proven framework you can use to grow as a content creator faster than you ever thought imaginable. I'm about to show you the most validated process humanity has ever created. You'll see. The Content Solicitor. This is a creator who grows slow because they're stubborn and perfectionistic. And there are three signs that you are this sort of creator. The second one was the one that I really struggled with and actually became the topic of a lot of therapy sessions. But first up, let's discuss this one. The Content Solicitor maintains the status quo. The status quo just refers to the existing state of affairs where things don't really improve, they're maintained. And this is kind of like playing a level of a video game over and over and over again, even though you've already completed that level just because it's easy and you feel safe and comfortable and competent without ever moving to the next one because that's outside of your comfort zone. So when you are maintaining the status quo as a content solicitor, you experience this thing called slow feedback loops. In case you haven't already realized, feedback is absolutely essential to grow as a content creator. However, when you experience these slow and infrequent feedback loops, surprise, surprise, you don't get any growth. Case in point, I spent 18 months building an online course that nobody wanted because I didn't validate that idea properly before executing it. Another aspect of the content solicitor maintaining the status quo and just keeping things as they are is that they workify everything they do. It just feels like a chore. I did the following list of things for 65 lessons over that 18 month period of building this online course. Outline all the lessons, draft, write all of the lessons, create the PDFs, create the slide, film, edit, and then upload all of the lessons. The whole creative act, the whole process was, as I say here, it was workified. Another sign that you are a content solicitor is that you are emotionally attached, meaning that you're emotionally attached to your content. It's a huge problem. The content solicitor identifies with their content so much to the extent that their self-worth is determined by how well that content does. I really struggled with this one in the tutoring business that had the online course. Shortly after launching the course and getting no sales, I became pretty depressed because I conflated my self-worth with how much people liked or didn't like the content. So I thought that because the course was a failure, I was a failure. Those two things were basically the same in my mind. And this is because when you are emotionally attached to the content, you are very subjective. Your feelings and emotions cloud your judgment about what is best for the content. I call this restrictive close-mindedness. It's when you're so zoomed in on just one way of doing something that you fail to see all the other ways that are potentially better of doing those things. And this was me because I was so zoomed in on my one way of doing the course, I spent 3000 hours and $80,000 building a do it yourself product when the people I was meant to be serving needed a done for you service or done with you service. The third and final sign that you are a content solicitor is this. You are competitive. All the content solicitor can think about is winning. As a result, they build in silence. Everything the content solicitor does must be kept a secret because they fear the other side, which is just every other creator, will get their best arguments or their content and then use them or copy them. As a result of having that ingrained mindset, they don't validate any ideas before they execute. And because of that, you go down this internal like mental rabbit hole of thinking, I need to win at all costs because the content solicitor thinks this is the only way to succeed. This makes it a zero sum game, which means that if I win, you lose. And if you win, then I have to lose. There's no win-win situation here. 
when I was building this online course, I thought my dad doubted me. So then I adopted this uh, like win at all costs mindset to think, okay, I am just going to persist and make this thing and finish it and it will be successful because I'm going to prove him wrong. But that didn't work out, did it? Hopefully you can see it is no surprise that the content solicitor ends up failing. But thankfully, there is a better way. The content scientist. This is a creator who grows fast because they're flexible and practical. And like the content solicitor, there are three telltale signs that you are a content scientist. Spoiler alert, it has taken me two and a half years to realize just how important the last one is. This is one of my all-time favorite concepts. The content scientist embraces the concept of Kaizen. Kaizen is a Japanese concept that embraces the process of continuous improvements over time. Think of Kaizen as making one percenters. So when a content scientist embraces the Kaizen philosophy, they experience fast feedback loops. And not only that, but those feedback loops are frequent. Instead of them happening like once every 18 months, like it happened for me, I'm going through feedback loops ideally every single day. This is because the content scientist assumes nothing and validates everything. It means that you're learning very quickly and more learning means more growth. You can think of this or liken it to that movie with Tom Cruise called The Edge of Tomorrow. Came out in 2014, aliens invade Earth and Tom Cruise gets sort of infected by like this alien ability to restart the beginning of the day whenever he is killed on the battlefield. He dies like thousands of times, but every time he dies, that's a feedback loop. And that feedback loop gives him a learning or a lesson and that lesson helps him grow or do better in the next time he's on the battlefield. That's why these fast feedback loops are so important. You become Tom Cruise. Because the content scientists embraces Kaizen, they also gamify the entire experience of creation. Every mini experiment the content scientist conducts is a quest that's fun and it's adventurous. I just finished reading Ali Abdal's book called Feel Good Productivity. And he makes some really good points about gamifying the experience of getting shit done. For me, one of the take home lessons was asking yourself, what would this look like if it were fun? I embrace that so much that it is currently my wallpaper. Nowadays, whenever I go to film a video lesson for my online community, I just jump on Loom, think about what I'm going to be talking about in that lesson hit record, have my two or three dot points, and I try to have fun. And then I do that for five to 10 minutes, share the Loom link inside the community, hit publish, done. It's a 30 minute process for one lesson compared to, I shit you not, what used to be literally 30 hours from start to finish for one lesson when I was doing the online course thing. That was the result of workifying creation. This is the result of gamifying creation. The content scientist is also emotionally detached from their content. You're able to cultivate your own self-worth from within instead of relying on the performance of your content to feel good. What this looks like as a little equation, because I fucking love a good equation, is the content performance does not equal your self-worth. And related to this idea of separating from content, when I was like identifying with it, I thought, well, this is a bit of a problem. I don't want to keep doing this, feeling this way. I came across the book, The Courage to Be Disliked. It has this awesome mental model called the separation of tasks. Imagine you are holding one end of a piece of rope and then a member of your audience is holding the other end. And that one member is representative of your entire audience. So once you hit publish on a piece of content, it travels from your end of the rope to that audience member's end. Importantly, once it travels to their end, you cut the rope in half. Suddenly, you have no control over how the content will be received by that audience member. They might love it, hate it, somewhere in the middle, but you have no control over that because the piece of rope is cut in half, your task is done, and it's time to move on to the next. And when you are emotionally detached from your content, you become objective about it. You're able to look at your work without bias. And I call this radical open-mindedness. It's when you're so zoomed out from the creative process that you can look at it objectively. You can see how your process fits into the bigger picture. If it's not the best one, you can just pick a better one. And I found it so much easier to embrace this idea of radical open-mindedness 
since starting the online community I have for Threads creators. I was making it free for the first 100 members and then making it paid. I conducted a mini experiment, the experiment failed and made the community free again, all within 48 hours. Talk about a fast feedback loop. Third and final sign of being a great content scientist is being collaborative. All the content scientists can think about is learning, not winning. As a result, the content scientist builds in public. They understand the entire point of the creative act is sharing your work and being inspired by others. Content scientists steal like artists. This makes growth easy because you're letting other creators validate ideas for you. So then if you're being smart about it, all you have to do is just execute on those ideas that you know already work. I stole this idea like an artist from Paul Mosey. I saw his announcement that he was becoming a co-owner in school in January of this year, 2024. And I realized like he did all of the work for me. He spent a lot of time and effort and money validating that school was the next big thing. I literally just stole his validation and then just started executing. And when you embrace this sort of collaborative process as a content scientist, it makes it very easy to fail at no cost. The content scientist knows the key to winning is failing quickly and cheaply, going through lots of feedback loops. They know creation is like science. Millions of people can benefit from one person's discovery. It's not win-lose, it's win-win. It is a positive sum game. This is what I'm doing inside the community. I'm giving away everything I know about growing on threads. A lot of the content doesn't land, but that's okay because they're quick and cheap little mini failures. So that is the content scientist. In case you didn't already realize, it's the type of creator you need to become to grow like crazy. The good news is we can use one of humanity's single greatest discoveries to help you do just that. The scientific method of content creation, aka the smock. The SMOC is a proven nine-step process that helps you create like a content scientist instead of a content solicitor and grow like crazy. Step one of the SMOC is ask a question. The question must be specific and it also must be measurable. Here's a question I asked when I was going through the nine-step process of the SMOC. Will narrowing the niche of my online community from creators just starting out to threads creators below 1,000 followers increase conversions? It's something very specific about how broad or narrow to make my niche and it's measurable. I can very easily measure the amount of conversions. Step two of the smock is to research that question. Here you want to gather information regarding what's already known about the question so you can identify gaps, avoid duplicating the efforts of someone else. So if someone has already answered this very question, you can save yourself the time of conducting the entire experiment by just looking at their results. And also you want to brainstorm potential hypotheses while you're doing this research. Some of the research I did, I looked at other successful school communities, noticed that every single one targeted a narrower niche than mine. Then I asked community members for their thoughts on that question. I also couldn't help but think about Paul Mosey's saying of riches are in the niches, as the Americans say. And then I also read basically the exact same thing of this in Nicholas Cole's book, The Art and Business of Online Writing. Moving on to step three, create hypothesis. This is where you develop a testable hypothesis based on that research you did in step two. What is a hypothesis? Basically, it's just a prediction. And hypotheses typically have an if-then type structure. The other part of this definition is it must be testable. It's falsifiable. What does that mean? It means that the prediction that you're making can be disproven. So here is my hypothesis. If I narrow the niche of my community to threads creators under 1000 followers, then membership requests will increase. This is a prediction that the membership requests will increase. It is an if-then statement. If I do this, then this will happen. And it's falsifiable because if this doesn't happen, then I've disproven that prediction. Moving on to step four, design mini experiment. This is where we want to determine the variables, the groups and the data of the experiment. Taking a look at variables. There are three types, independent, dependent and controlled. The independent variable is the one factor that's being changed so you can observe its effect on the dependent variable. 
and that relates to the next one. Dependent variables is a thing we're observing because we think the independent variable will have some sort of effect on this one thing. And then the controlled variables are basically the constants. It's everything else about the experiment that's being kept the same. So we can accurately record and measure the effect of the independent variable on the dependent one. In my experiment, the independent variable or the thing I'm changing is the copy of the content I use to promote my community. The thing that I think will change as a result of the independent is the number of membership requests I get for my community. So I'm measuring the effect of the change of copy on the number of membership requests. Those are the two sort of main things I want to keep an eye on. That means everything else are the controlled variables. The most important ones are the things I'm not changing is how often I'll be promoting the community and for how long. Then we have the groups. We have the control group and we have the experimental group. The control group is when the independent variable is not changed and the experimental group is when the independent variable is changed. For the control group, I promoted Saints College for aspiring content creators once a day on threads for seven days. Nothing changed. And for the experimental group, I promote Saints College as an online community for threads creators who want the shortcut to their first 1000 followers once a day on threads over the next seven days. The third and final thing we want to determine the data. We have quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative data is numerical info that can be measured or counted. In our example, this is literally just the number of membership requests I get. You can measure it and you can count it. Qualitative data is non-numerical and descriptive information. In the example, this could be stuff like feedback from members about the change, replies to the promotional posts on threads, feedback from non-members about why they chose not to join. Now we move on to the fun part, which is where we conduct the mini experiment. All we're doing is carrying out the control group and experimental group experiments that we designed in step four. Firstly, we want to replicate it over and over again. In my example, I'm doing that by replicating some sort of promotional post seven days and obviously while we're conducting the mini experiment we want to make sure we're collecting the data that we just spoke about and on this topic of data we go to step six which is where we analyze that data for quantitative in the control group i had nine membership requests after posting every day for seven days and in the experimental group where i changed the promotional copy i got 33 membership requests in terms of the qualitative data for the control group, and remember this is more descriptive stuff, uh, I had comments like, I'm not sure what to do here. And in the experimental group, when I started to narrow the niche more, I got comments like, I like the Monday missions, it's like weekly homework tasks, but fun. With that data, we move on to step seven, draw conclusion. All we're doing here is determining whether the data we just saw either supports our hypothesis or it refutes it, it goes against it. Remember that my hypothesis was if I narrow the niche of my community to threads creators under 1000 followers, then membership requests will increase. The quantitative data first, there were nine in the control group and 33 in the experimental group. And also bear in mind the positive qualitative data I got. So overall, we can say that the data supports the hypothesis. Once we've done that, we move on to step eight. We document the results. Here we want to record the precise results in private and then share something about the experiment in public. And on this idea of recording in private, we're doing this so we don't make the same mistake again. For me, all I did here was just record the results in my daily happenings page in Notion. In terms of sharing the results in public, this is just as simple as documenting the journey for yourself and your audience. And there's no real right or wrong way to do this. You're just sharing your work and you can do it in any way whatsoever. I did this by publishing a post on threads about the importance of having like a broad brand, but then a specific product. We're on to the final step. Step nine, we take action. Two options here. We can either implement the findings or repeat the whole process with a new hypothesis. If our hypothesis was supportive, that's where we implement the findings. And if the hypothesis was refuted or it wasn't proven, this is where we repeat the smock. Because my hypothesis was supported, I actually got more membership requests in the experimental group. I took action, implement those findings by adjusting the landing page copy to make the niche narrower. I changed the type of content inside the community by focusing it more on threads. 
And then I'm promoting the community once a day on threads by using the narrower niche of thread creators instead of creators just starting out. Let's say that the hypothesis was refuted. Narrowing the niche wasn't a good idea based on the data. I'd go back to square one, ask a new question and a different hypothesis. And that is the nine step scientific method of content creation, the smock. Simple summary, the content solicitor. This is a creator that grows slow because they're a stubborn perfectionist. The content scientist. This is a creator that grows fast because they're flexible and practical. Finally, we have the smock, the scientific method of content creation. Step one, ask a question. Step two, we research that question. Three, create a hypothesis. Four, design mini experiment. Five, conduct mini experiment. Six, we analyze the data. Seven, draw a conclusion. Eight, document the results. And finally, nine, take action. And here is the lesson. It is the one thing you should take away from everything we have discussed so far. Stop being a content solicitor and start being a content scientist by using the scientific method of content creation. To close, here is a quote from me. Create like a scientist. Thank you so much for watching this lesson. I am adopting this by trying to get 1% better going through fast feedback loops in my YouTube videos. I'm currently at around 170 subscribers. If you are the sort of person who supports amateur creators like myself, please take like two seconds to hit the subscribe button and get me one step closer to that milestone. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for being here. And that is it for this lesson. Keep it simple until the next one. Also, if you did like this lesson, check out this one. It's all about why the internet is like a dark forest with lots of aliens in it.